So we're now in the uh, larger room in the historic structure, the building that was built, the part of the structure, which actually was itself a standalone building, built in 1897. And what we've done is we've completely changed this particular room. And so the first thing you may notice is some cosmetic details uh, that we've brought in. Um, for instance, we've rounded the corners. We've put in a uh, higher base. Uh, so those are some expenses that would not be required if one was just going for the high performance building envelope. Uh, and when we've done some of these aesthetic details, we've brought in uh, what we would say is maybe a more um, recent addition to our understanding about what a building can do or should do or might do. Here we are in the Lotus Room. So we're in the old part of the building. And you'll see that in this model, which was created as part of the permitting process, actually uh, building this model was a breakthrough in the process with the city and with the historical landmarks board. Um, essentially what we were getting permission to do was to put in this dormer here. And what we're going to do is walk through the building today and we're here in this room. So the windows behind the camera right now are these windows here. So there's a, a little room here and then we have a, another room, a, 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 a downstairs office that uh, we're just now turning into an Ayurveda and chai store. There's a little storage room that's a connecting piece. Uh, a lot of mechanicals are in the basement and then we have two upstairs offices and a bathroom which is uh, part of the uh, Ayurveda clinic and treatment and psychotherapy area. Uh, then in the middle is an, a, an adjoining room that has a big round skylight and we call that the skylight room and we rent that out. We also rent out this lotus room but we tend to keep this room more for Ayurveda meditation, things like that. Uh, then we have the, the big back part of the building which is this old cinder block structure which as we've mentioned we covered with three inches of foam and then a layer of yellow stucco, hence the yellow paper. Um, and we also have on top of the large flat roof here a solar panel array and a, a narrow uh, porch which is all the city would allow us. Uh, this parapet here was intended to be a planter um, but we ran into some uh, building code issues so all we were able to do was put up a, a wall for now that's at the 36 inch height. So what we'll do is we'll uh, start in this room, we'll walk in, we'll take a look at the skylight room, then we'll be looking uh, upstairs uh, and then we'll, we'll eventually explore the, the back area. Um, and once again, as mentioned, there are several solar systems in this structure. Uh, one is a direct solar gain. So there are three banks of windows up as part of the shed roof that has a correct overhang. That system generates 10% of the entire heating load of the building. Uh, we also have heat mirror windows in this part of the structure that generate some heat. A trombe wall over here and then this active collection system which is actually three banks of panels. Uh, we were looking at evacuated tube panel versus a uh, high quality flat plate panel and one of the things that we always have to think about when we're doing green architecture is dollars first. So how, mu how many years is it going to take to pay back the investment that's put into a system? Ideally uh, the number is 30 years or less. Um, this technology, the evacuated tube, is rather expensive and so uh, we came to the conclusion that it was not the most cost-effective way to go. Um, nevertheless, we do generate a tremendous amount of heat with these solar array, nine flat panels, um, that uh, feed a, about an 850 gallon storage tank in the basement. Uh, we also took away some HVAC systems, uh, modified the swamp cooler array. Oh, and there's other things I'm sure we'll, we'll remember as we get into them. So we continue our discussion of the sustainable building principles uh, here in the Lotus Room and we start with uh, the, a conversation because we're in this historic building of the 
sometimes conflicting objectives of historic preservation and sustainable architecture. They don't always go well together. The case, one case where they do go well together, for instance, in the back half of the building where we have a, a significant embodied energy in uh, concrete, uh, for sure in that case, those two principles fit well together. In this building, because we had to do so much to bring the building up to code and um, make the building envelope uh, effective, uh, I can't say that they were necessarily in agreement. So we had to walk the, the, uh, the razor's edge and uh, do what we had to do for historic preservation and then do everything we could to uh, create an effective uh, building envelope with all of its systems woven into this historic building. So looking here at this window, coming back here, um, the, the wood in this window was probably hand planed in 1897. And uh, the historic preservation people wanted us to retain the window. And so we did that. And the sashes themselves are original, more than 100 years old. The lights have been replaced with a thin uh, I think it's just a thermopane uh, window. I don't think we could get heat mirror in here. And of course, because we have these old windows that were handmade, uh, we have a potential infiltration issue. And there are some ways to deal with that. We can work on putting in some copper uh, uh, wind uh, shields. Um, and one of the interesting uh, areas where we had to deal with this was these are old windows and they have the iron uh, weights that move up and down with the window sashes and so there's a sash pocket which in the original construction we have brick on the outside and then this actual two inch by four inch framing that forms the sash pocket you when we opened it up you could see daylight through various places and we have hundred mile an hour winds in the winter coming up against this wall that's a problem because we had to retain the old windows we had to retain the sash pockets or the windows wouldn't operate properly. We could maybe give up some windows, but we didn't want to do that. So what we did is we put Reflectix uh, bubble film. It's a sandwich of foam and mylar, which gives you about R15 when it's installed correctly around the sash pocket. So we created an insulated sash pocket. The people who are the professional uh, window restores, they had no idea about that. They had no idea what to do about the sash pocket. So that would be uh, an, an incidence of uh, having to solve a problem to create, uh, to meet design objectives while meeting other requirements of the site. Uh, in addition to that, um, we, we had to do a lot of things with the structure, especially in this old building. Um, and I'm gonna let Peter describe some of his experience and what was done here, uh, because the, there's kind of a story uh, in various parts. We started off uh, making a topographic map out of the floors of this building in order to see where the building had actually settled. And knowing that the foundation was very old and was built on dry lime mortar, which was uh, used early in the, or late in the 18th century, uh, Portland concrete didn't come into the country until 1904. So we had some settlement issues and uh, starting with the topographic map, we knew where to uh, raise the, the floors of this building. So we used uh, 20 ton jacks and moved everything up to where they were. We created new load bearing points in the basement uh, and with the intention of taking those load bearing points all the way up to a new ridge beam in the, uh, the roof um, and that new ridge beam was also going to support uh, the dormer that we added on to increase the passive solar of the building. So we had uh, many new uh, structural members added to the wall and even in this room itself the uh, floor joists were joined in the middle of this room and there was a supporting wall at some point. Uh, whoever, a previous owner, took that wall out. And so you had an unsupported floor up there that has subsided several inches. And it's fortunate that Vardon didn't wind up in this room in a pile of desks and chairs and whatever. So we added a uh, structural member right in the center. I'm gonna try to point at that right now. Um, 
if you can see that right there I'm going to back up a little bit uh, so we added load points uh, for that too and why don't you show the corner detail that we provided to mitigate the experience of uh, of the uh, when the beam is coming to the wall, that creates a certain sense. And so, and there, there needed to be additional structure. So to handle the bump out, to create a certain aesthetic feeling, um, I think Peter came up with this arrangement. So again, we're playing with the, uh, with this building, we're, with the aesthetic dimension, we're playing with a certain geometric rhythm. Um, and so you'll see that in various quarters uh, just a side point about the structure, one thing we did, as I mentioned from outside, um, it's basically a, a field stone uh, foundation that was uh, originally constructed with dry land mortar, a lot of which had, was gone. And so uh, what Peter did was go from the inside especially and fortify that with Portland cement, which we could do because it was a quartzite uh, stone you cannot really do a lot of Portland cement repair on dry lime mortar brick buildings if they're structural in particular because that creates uh, hard areas that will then uh, fracture the brick. So that's, that's a no-no in historic preservation. We could do that with the quartzite foundation and even tie that in in some cases with the new structure. So because we had to put the structure in and make foundation footings, new foundation footings essentially, uh, we were able to get away with uh, working with Portland cement. Um, it was sort of an interesting side conversation. Uh, now looking back at the wall again, remember that we have the, the pocket here. This is the um, sash pocket and next to the sash pocket is a series of actual two inch by four inch uh, uh, two by fours essentially, studs, and those were milled uh, probably up in the mountains from Doug Fir. They're actual two inches by four inches. Now remember we have 100 mile an hour winds coming up against the building envelope in the winter, icy cold. Uh, there's an infiltration problem. And uh, because we didn't re really want to give up a lot of space and also internally for aesthetic reasons, if we have to retain the original windows, um, we have to deal with how are we going to insulate this? A real challenge. Uh, on the outside, we've got brick, helps a little bit, but we've got this two inch by four inch cavity that's just a raw cavity. How do we deal with that? So what we chose to do was to use a, a blown in polyurethane foam because we get an R value of seven per inch uh, and it tends to fill all the interstices and cavities and create a decent infiltration barrier. Now, on the subject of sustainable architecture, what we need to do is look at green building and we considered the soy based polyurethane foam, but when we went a little deeper, we were paying quite a bit more money for the soy based material and it's only about 3% soy, so it really is still a polyurethane foam which will outgas. Polyurethane foam outgassing has carcinogenic effects. So what we did is we went with standard polyurethane foam and then put a layer of plastic on the inside to isolate the toxic load of the insulation treatment uh, from the inhabitants and the users of the building. This is a healing center, this side of the building in particular. And so that was a choice that we made. And this is sort of a, an example of how we step away from the sort of commercial hyped green architecture uh, and look at the whole picture and, and come up with our own uh, determinations about what sustainable architecture really means. And you'll see some perspectives that you might not see in the, in the ordinary or common uh, green movement. For instance, this carpet is a standard commercial carpet. Uh, this is a heavy traffic commercial building um, and the, the pop bottle carpet uh, does not hold up very well in a commercial environment. That's our experience. Um, we've, we've put them in several times. Um, this carpet is uh, designed to last a very long time. And so if we look cradle to grave uh, in terms of cost, it certainly outperforms other carpets. Uh, but I think even in a sustainability equation, because what do you do with a pop bottle carpet when it's gone? Um, there isn't much you can do. There's some recycling efforts, but most of that 
uh, is not reused again. Um, so it, it, it is recycled once. Um, instead, consider something that just simply lasts a very long time. This is an impermeable waterproof carpet. It lasts a very long time. Coming back to surface treatments uh, and design principles, stepping away from pure sustainability, what one thing that we've done is look at uh, aesthetics. So we've brought in these geometric elements. For instance, in this sconce treatment, we've rounded the corner and brought the corner in and, and rounded it off at a human scale. There's an equilateral triangle here. And if you look here, this is essentially a golden rectangle pattern from the bottom of the sconce. And then the sconce itself has a very pure uh, geometric shape, very clean lines. And that's an aesthetic that, that has been brought into the building just to make it feel comfortable to be in the building. Another design principle I like is uh, going in with a slightly thicker base. Um, I find that uh, a bigger base makes the building feel more like a temple. Uh, it also brings the energy down to the ground. They're just the experience, the, the building, the wall feels rooted in the ground and it creates a sense of peace in the building envelope. Okay, we're still in the Lotus Room. Maybe the heart of the building in a certain way. Very dear to my heart, this room. Uh, well, before we move on, I want to introduce a conversation about mechanical systems. And the reason is, it's the mechanical systems we're talking about heating, cooling, things like that. Uh, these are the systems that are going to consume probably the most energy of the building uh, during its lifetime. So it's definitely in a remodel, it's definitely an opportunity to pick that up, see what we can do to improve the building performance in general. And so what we've done is we've put in hydronic heating and basically there's uh, water tubes under my feet that are heating the entire building and those are preheated from the solar panels and the big tank in the basement with a Boudreaux boiler that's about 97% efficient. So that's definitely how we want to heat the building as much as we can. But meanwhile, we inherited a building that has an HVAC system. So you can see the chase here in the vent. And the thing about that is you've got the ability to move air through the building. Uh, now in a remodel, especially if it's an older building, you, if it's like the flexible um, ductwork that has the uh, uh, fiberglass in it and maybe broken and so on. That's just a trap for parasites. So the best thing to do is just to throw that away. Sorry, you just really the best thing to do is just to throw that away or get it cleaned while you still have a lot of dust around. Um, deal with that. But the advantage of having these two systems working together is we have, first of all, a cooling system, which is great. We also get air changes. So we also have the ability to move some air through the building envelope, another project I worked on is sort of a tower in shape so that it can be an important de-stratification system and so that's allowed when you have a really smart thermostat like this modern Honeywell here. Um, so the one thing to watch is that in this case for instance we have two control systems, two thermostats and this thermostat, it, you pay a little more for this for a hydronic system so we have a lot of different zones each of which has a setback timer so that allows us to control the heating cycle in each different zone, each different room, as they're going to be used. That is another major efficiency gain, setback thermostat. But in this case, it's setback per zone. Very nice. And then there's uh, manual temporary overrides and options like that. Same thing here. The other advantage of an HVAC system, in addition to uh, your hydronic system, is the HVAC, first of all, if you have a uh, sudden decrease in temperature, say. Um, you can kick a little heat into your building envelope and it, it really is nice to be able to do that because the hydronic is slow. It doesn't heat the, the building in 10 or 15 minutes the way an HVAC system is. And in this climate, should this system fail and it's really dark and cold, this system can be set to kick in and keep our pipes from freezing. It's a nice feature. So we're entering now the packing room and um, what I want to share with you, another thing that we've brought throughout the building are these curtains. Now, one thing we're really working to do is to reduce the toxic load in the building envelope. So in addition to using low VOC paint and that sort of thing, um, a, a fabric like this, which is a nice solution. So I'm uh, creating a storage opportunity, an opportunity to create a visual uh, screen 
from things that are everyday uh, items, ladders, chairs, tables, whatever, whatever we want to hide. Uh, but so it's a great solution, heavy duty track system. Uh, this is a um, theater system. The advantage of going with these curtains is that the fire retardant is not the chemicals that are commonly now in furniture, children's toys that are known, hormone disruptors, carcinogens, uh, banned in California in some cases, but they're still using other chemicals as fire retardants. And the more we learn about them, the more we really don't want them in our built environment, especially in a large, expansive a piece of fabric like this. So this is a salt, simple salt treatment, been around for a long time. It's a theater curtain, very durable, great solution to that problem. Another thing that I, I want to share is we brought this room, which was completely dark. It's in the very middle of the building. Uh, we brought some daylighting in. So got a lot of light on today, but normally there are no lights on in here. And it used to be this room was completely dark. You had to flip the light switch to do anything. So now we've brought in daylighting two different ways. Uh, we've restored an existing uh, wall penetration. We had to put in the fire door to meet fire code. And then we brought in a light shaft under a skylight. And that skylight really makes a difference in the room upstairs. So daylighting, very important theme. If you can bring that in, it's a very elegant solution and in significantly improves quality of life. So light, people like light in their, in their space. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is the mechanical room down below. It used to be that the access to this basement area was on the other side of this wall. This is an ex was an exterior wall when this was a, a, an old building. This was probably the back porch or something like that. And there, there's a stairway that goes down into the basement. We actually closed that off and in that stairway, that's where we put our 850 gallon water storage. And instead, now we have a trap door where we can get access to all of our mechanical systems, phone, electric, everything like that, computer. We did wire the building with CAT5, brought it up to snuff so we could reduce electromagnetic radiation from Wi-Fi if we choose to do that. And we did some improvements in the basement that originally had a, a dirt floor uh, and just stone walls and we poured concrete, uh, put in a drain and we installed frames for all electrical and hydronic systems down in the basement. So now it's um, much improved in terms of a utility room. And then there will be a light that will turn on automatically as I descend. 